It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Wissam Ismail, Professor of Nephropathology. Professor uh, Wissam is a renal pathologist with ex experience more than 15 years in interpretation of native and renal transplant biopsies. She is an assistant professor uh, of pathology at medical school, director of histopathology lab of University Hospitals, Venice Wave University, and is the owner and director of, uh, of pathology lab, a private renal pathology service in Cairo, Egypt, a very uh, famous lab, uh, well equipped and high quality. Professor Wissam is the deputy chair of the renal pathology Com uh, committee of the International Society of Nephrology uh, and ISN educational ambassador of renal pathology since uh, more than six years and a former ISN fellow uh, between 2001-2002. She was a member of Educational Committee of the International Renal Pathology Society in 2014. She had researched and published in transplantation pathology as well as uh, different aspects of renal pathology. And uh, I am very fond of the hair research in amyloid and elect amyloid. Um, uh, she is a well-known speaker in numerous international and regional meetings involved in renal pathology teaching activities in Africa, Middle East, and was awarded by the British Global Kidney Academy for improving renal pathology surface within the region. This is added, this is the, during the meeting, the Egyptian Committee for Pathology Training Annual Histopathology Conference in the last February. This was a very nice meeting, joined by the uh, international figures and uh, the national figures of the nephropathology, and I enjoyed uh, attendance of this meeting. Uh, Professor Hussam enriched our um, webinars, 12 uh, webinars, uh, from uh, starting from the date of March 20. So since the 20th of March up to uh, today, it is the 13th webinar, and uh, it, she uh, had already 12 webinars, 24 hours, and this is a treasure of nephropathology for nephrologists and for uh, people interested in pathology. Today, she will speak uh, in the second part of renal transplant pathology that will be dedicated for T cell mediated rejection and viral nephropathies. I am sure that uh, this meeting will be a unique and will enrich our uh, experience in nephropathology of renal transplantation. Now the floor is to you, Professor Wissam, to start your presentation. Thank you very much. I am unmuting you, Dr. Sam. Yes, yes. 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 <laughs> Dr. Halawa, do you like to, to add something in introductory points? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Hussain. Just uh, I would like to welcome my colleagues and uh, my students from University of Liverpool. Today, the second part of uh, um, uh, Professor uh, Wassam Ismail uh, pathology webinar. She is an eminent pathologist who is interested in education as well, which is very important. And actually, she's um, you know uh, relating to her practice and also to the national guidelines. Uh, uh, welcome, my colleagues, and hopefully you will enjoy this webinar. There is another one coming next week, next Monday, same time. I'm going to forward the link to you. Um, hopefully, in the next week or so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Halawa. It is our pleasure to uh, join this meeting with you and your colleagues from Liverpool. Yes, Professor Hussain. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hussain, for the introduction. Today, as you mentioned, is the second part in uh, transplantation pathology. And I would like to focus today on T-cell mediated rejection and its related differential diagnosis. Hopefully, we will have enough time to cover viral nephropathies as well. Since we started transplantation and uh, till to date, our main problems in allograft loss still rotates around rejection, whether it's an acute form of rejection or chronic rejection, followed by interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, which is sometimes of an unknown cause, and uh, viral infections headed by polyomavirus nephropathy. 
So I'll start today with, with the main uh, focus, which is T-cell mediated rejection. Now, in month 2019, have placed T-cell mediated rejection diagnostic categories it, uh, into category four, as it had always been since month 1994. This didn't change. And T-cell mediated rejection is classified into acute TCMR with its, with its grades and types and chronic active TCL mediated rejection. But also we have category three, which is also encompasses T-cell mediated rejection, which is borderline rejection or what we consider suspicious for acute T-cell mediated rejection. Now, T-cell mediated rejection histologically would affect almost all the compartments of the kidney, but with more dominant compartments than others. So it dominantly affects tubular interstitium and the arteries. So tubular interstitium and arterial compartments are the two main compartments which are commonly affected by T-cell mediated rejection. Peritoral capillaries are, affect, are also uh, affected in association with the tubular interstitium and glomeruli could be affected, although not very common. The Banff lesion scores assess actually the presence and the degree of these histopathological changes within the different compartments. So we score the pathological changes, mainly focusing on changes which is related to rejection, but not exclusive. We also score other changes which can be present, as I'm going to give you examples, which are not directly related to the rejection process, and we score them. Let me remind you with the scores we've discussed last time, and the scores which are used to establish a diagnosis related to T-cell mediated rejection are acute MAM scores I, T, and V, chronic band scores CV, and uh, scores which are considered both for acute and chronic scores like TI, IFTA, and TIFTA, which we are going to discuss. Before we get into details of T-cell mediated rejection, remember that BANF scores are not a diagnosis. So scoring a biopsy or giving a score which is related to rejection is not sufficient to place this biopsy into a diagnostic category we place it into a diagnostic category using the scores plus additional diagnostic parameters like other histopathological findings which could be present, molecular if available, serological and or clinical scenarios. And we've discussed this before in relation to um, subclinical or the modifi modifi uh, modifications of the clinical presentations of the patients. Let's start with acute active T-cell mediated rejection. Now, um, acute TCMR, mainly starts at the corticum dolary junction. Classically, it occurs one to six weeks after transplantation, but it can occur any time post-transplant. And it's common, it's not uncommon. It is common to find acute, an acute element of T-cell mediated rejection late post-transplantation. The cells involved in this process of rejection are predominantly T lymphocytes and monocytes slash macrophages. Acute T-cell mediated rejection is classified into three grades, Grade one, subclassified into A and B according to the severity, and grade one targets tubular interstitial only. Then grade two, which, target, which is um, uh, considered when we have arterial involvement and is also subclassified into A and B according to the severity. And then we have grade three, which is severe or marked um, uh, affection of the arteries, what we call transmural arteritis. Let's start with grade one or type one, which is tubular interstitium. Now, tubulitis, or what we consider the T-score, is the whole mark of T-cell mediated rejection, meaning I cannot start to classify a biopsy as, being, as rejecting if I don't have tubulitis. So what is tubulitis? Tubulitis is the presence of lymphocytes, as you can see in the arrows, towards the basolateral aspect of the uh, tubular basement membrane. So here is a tubule, a proximal tubule, and you can see the lymphocytes close to the basement membrane. Again, here another lymphocyte, and here another lymphocyte. The score, it depends mainly on the number of lymphocytes which we can count inside a tubular cross-section or per 10 tubular epithelial cells which correspond to a, to a single tubular cross-section. So this is a score which evaluates the degree of inflammation within the epithelium of the cortical tubules. This is, um, a, you can see here, tubulitis in different, different 
uh, degrees of tubulitis in different tubules. And to consider this tubulitis significant, I need at least two foci of tubulitis within a biopsy to consider having um, that this tubulitis could really uh, be considered significant. So if I can only find a single tubule with lymphocytes as an evidence of tubulitis in the biopsy, I wouldn't consider this enough to start a T-score. Associated with tubulitis, as you can see here, you can get tub the tubules themselves and the tubulitis is marked, start to rupture, and you can get tubular cell necrosis and destruction of the tubular basement membranes. And then it is really difficult to score tubulitis in these uh, scenarios, especially for beginners, because the, the tubular basement membranes are not clear because they are, they are continu discontinuous. However, the T-score is based on the most affected tubule or the most severely affected tubules. As you can see here, this is a tubule with a T3 count. You have more than 10 lymphocytes within the tubular cross-section. So it's not the percentage or surface area of the tubules affected. It's the most affected tubule by the tubulitis, and hence we base the score on it. According to BAMF 2017, we score acute T-cell mediated rejection, as well as chronic active T-cell mediated rejection in both non-atrophic tubules and slightly or moderately atrophic tubules. This, was, this is a major change through the years in T-cell mediated rejection because when we started scoring for T-cell mediated rejection, we completely ignored any tubule with atrophy. But as I said, this has changed. And uh, in 2017, we scored it for, uh, for the diagnosis of acute T-cell mediated rejection, not borderline, for the diagnosis of T-cell mediated rejection, whether acute or chronic active, the tubular interstitial types in uh, moderately also and slightly atrophic uh, tubules. Severely atrophic tubules are not considered. This is an example of what we consider slightly and moderately atrophic tubules. The basement membranes start to be thickened and slightly wrinkled, but without marked uh, uh, affection of the tubular lumina. You can also get tubular atrophy with marked affection of the, um, of the lumina without affection of the tubular basement membranes. However, you can see that we still have here considerable tubulitis, so this is eligible for a T-score 2. This is an example of the tubulitis T-score. T0 means that we have no mononuclear cells in the tubules or a single focus of tubulitis only, as I've mentioned. T1, we count from one to four. Then we have T2, more than four, up to 10, and T3, more than 10. It's only T2 and T3, which we consider significant for an acute T-cell mediated rejection element. So starting from a score of two, then I consider that we do have a rejection process. The second score, which is considered in T-cell mediated rejection and in tubular interstitial type, which is type, is the I score. I score scores the degree of inflammation in non scarred areas of cortex, meaning that we score the extent of inflammation according to the surface area of the biopsy provided in areas which are not related to fibrosis. So, this is what we consider an I score. Expected with, uh, with the inflammatory infiltrate to get sometimes significant edema, and the cells which are present within the interstitial infiltrate in a rejection biopsy. and variable degrees of plasma cells, less often isinophils, and rarely neutrophils. Rarely neutrophils in order to classify the biopsy as a rejection. Banff has long before added um, a recommendation that an asterisk shall be added to Banff lesion score I if we have more than 5 to 10% of a different type of cell rather than lymphocyte and monocyte. I have to say that this is a comment which is ignored by more than 90% of renal pathologists. I don't know if you ever see it in a transplant uh, report in your different uh, centers. Maybe your pathologist uh, does it, but I don't. We usually forget it. And because um, I personally think that whenever you have a significant other cell infiltrate, it, it is important to uh, include it, not just by an asterisk, to mention it within the diagnosis, as I'm going to uh, show you. This is a typical um, interstitial inflammation in rejection process. You can see that mainly we have lymphocytes and edema, and we do have scattered eosinophils. 
uh, this, this is another infiltrate with tubulitis and you don't have xenophils, uh, very few xenophils here, uh, uh, more common uh, plasma cells and also lymphocytes. What if we have an xenophilic dominant infiltrate? I know that what comes to your mind is a drug-induced interstitial nephritis, but no, this is still not common within a rejection process, but accepted within a rejection infiltrate. And the more xenophils we have, the more chance that if we do not see an arterial component to the rejection process, that we are missing it somewhere. So xenophils are directly related actually to, um, to a more severe form of rejection, mainly arterial involvement. If we have a lot of neutrophils, then cannot classify it as, rejection, as a rejection process anymore, or at least not as a pure T-cell mediated rejection process, because if you have neutrophils, and if you have neutrophilic tubulitis, like in this case, meaning it's the neutrophils which are attacking the tubules, not the mononuclear cells, then this is a process of infection, and this is an acute bacterial or acute infectious tubular interstitial, uh, whether bacterial or fungus, but not uh, viral. Viral infections do not bring neutrophils in. And if you have dominant plasma cells, as you can see, then you also consider a different differential diagnosis. The I score or the, uh, uh, the extent of interstitial inflammation is scored also from zero to three, and uh, zero is no inflammation or less than 10% of unscored cortical parenchyma. So we, here it's not only it's not complete absence, up to 10% of unscarred cort inflammation on uh, cortical parenchyma is not really con uh, considered. Then I1 is from 10 to 25%. Then we have I2 up to 50 and I3 more than 50. Again, for um, a placing uh, a biopsy into the category of rejection, we start from I2. So I1 and I0 are not considered enough threshold to consider that the patient is rejecting. In Banff 1997, areas that was not considered for the Banff I score were fibrotic areas, the immediate subcapsular cortex, the adventitia around large veins and lymphatics, and I will come to this later. However, in 2007, and also nodular infiltrates, perivascular nodular infiltrates. However, in 2007, we modified this, and nodular infiltrate and non-scored areas are also uh, considered within the I score. So type 1 tubular interstitial uh, T cell mediated rejection is uh, subclassified into grade 1A and grade 1B according to the extent of tubulitis. So to say that we have a grade 1A T cell mediated rejection, we need interstitial inflammation score of I2 or I3, meaning starting of more than 25% of the uh, cortical parenchyma inflamed particle, not medullary with moderate tubulitis T2. If the tubulitis is T2, then it's 1A. If the tubulitis is T3, then it's 1B. So the main, uh, but both have the minimum threshold of an I2 for the diagnosis of T-cell mediated rejection. Let's have a case. Now, this was a male patient, 54 years old. He received the living unrelated renal transplant uh, since three years. Uh, presenting with and um, presented with a serum creat of 2.7 uh, almost and a protein creat ratio of 116. His unknown or, um, his original disease was unknown, but was query hypertensive. This patient received no induction. Post operative course was uneventful. Maintenance therapy he was on a classic triple maintenance therapy uh, to chromis MMF and steroids. Other medications include and uh, included antihypertensive drugs. And his baseline serum creatinine, or through since he started the transplant, was ranging from 1.2 to 1.5 milligram percent. His stack level at the time of biopsy was within accepted range. So this is a patient who um, a, suddenly presented with a serum creat of 2.7 from a baseline of 1.5 with accepted um, tack, uh, uh, drug uh, levels. There was no mention of uh, DSA at the time of a biopsy. So this is his biopsy. The biopsy was adequate as um, a, it had 12 glomeruli and three arteries. So this was quite an adequate biopsy. And as you can see, already the biopsy had some interstitial fibrosis. This is an H&E stain. These are the glomeruli and they appeared more or less 
uh, okay, and there was an interstitial, a patchy interstitial infiltrate with a few xenophils, actually. And on a higher uh, power, you can see that this patient had tubulitis, but the tubulitis was mainly mediated by plasma cells, as you can see here. And the infiltrate was predominantly a plasma cell infiltrate, rather than just lymphocytes. Again, this is another aspect, and you can see marked plasma cell tubulitis. You can hardly see the tubule from the amount of plasma cells which were, was attacking the tubule. Another focus where you have lymphocytes and again, numerous uh, plasma cells with uh, tubulitis. There was nothing significant in the glomeruli. This is a hysterochrome, and you can see that he did have mild, a mild interstitial fibrosis and a mild degree of tubular atrophy. Um, these are the, uh, the glomeruli. There were no glomeruli, there's no uh, capillary basement membrane changes. And so his BANF scores were C2 and I2, which are the minimal threshold for a T-cell mediated rejection. He had um, inflammatory cells in his paratubular capillaritis, which is okay because we have interstitial inflammation, so we have PTC2. He had mild arterial hyalinosis, a score of one. And he had early chronic changes. So his score was just one and, I'm sorry, this is one, not two. And he had a total inflammatory score too. I'll, I'll get to this later. And his C4D was negative. So the diagnosis was basically an acute active T-cell mediated rejection, BANF type grade 1A, plasma cell rich, C4D negative, T-cell mediated rejection. Now, when we get a plasma cell rich infiltrate in the biopsy, we need to exclude first a differential diagnosis, mainly viral infections, CMV and a BK or glioma virus nephropathy, as well as BTLD or post-transplant proliferative disease. Following the biopsy, patient urine cytology was negative for decoy cells. We've done SV40 and it was negative. CMV, PCR and Epstein-Barr virus was negative. So his final diagnosis was really a pure T-cell mediated rejection, but a plasma cell rich type. What about plasma cell rich acute rejection? Now this type of rejection was first described very early on in 1999 by Charney et al. This type of rejection is, carries a very poor prognosis, is resistant to all forms of therapy. This is the T cell mediated rejection, although it is dominantly plasma cells, but all through the years, there was absolutely no link uh, proven whatsoever related to any form of antibodies or a humoral reaction to this type of rejection. As I, and as I said, this is very bad news, unfortunately, to the patients. So this is, it is considered a subtype of uh, type one uh, acute uh, T-cell mediated rejection. When we have other findings or other pathologies within the interstitium, we need to consider whether we have anything else going on beside the T-cell mediated rejection. And one of the most remarkable findings is actually the presence of interstitial hemorrhage. If you have interstitial hemorrhage and remarkable tubular injury, maybe you should consider um, adenovirus, which is, not, uh, which is not common at all, at least in our population. Or more commonly, you consider that you can have antibodies as well, so that this is not a pure T-cell mediated rejection, that this patient could have also an element of antibody mediated rejection. Of course, if you have a dominant infiltrating pattern of um, uh, mononuclear cells, and especially if these cells start to be atypical, then you can, or as you can see here, this uh, wiping infiltrate by um, uh, the mononuclear cells, then you need to consider PTLD or post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, also not a common a finding, but has to be considered within the differential diagnosis, bearing in mind that not all patients with PTLD are EBV positive. The second type of acute T-cell mediated rejection Excuse is me, called... Professor Hussam, uh, uh, because uh, I'm very interested in the plasma-rich rejection. I think the 10% is the cutoff point to say plasma-rich rejection. Am I right? Yes. 10% of the cortex inf infiltrated by plasma cell to say plasma rich rejection. And whenever we see this, we search for DSA, as you mentioned, because we assume that antibody mediated rejection may be in the background as well, not only the cell mediated rejection. And uh, when we diagnose plasma cell rejection, we expect, as you mentioned, borer prognosis. So 
uh, and the, one of the most important points is to try to uh, exclude the presence of viral infection, especially BK nephropathy. Uh, this type of plasma cell rich rejection actually is directly related to non-compliance of the patient. Yes. So there was absolutely no proof of the literature in the literature all through these years, more than 20 years now, for any form of DSA, C4D, whatever we come up with something new related to antibodies, plasma cell rich rejection is again um, investigated in relation to this, and we still reach, get to um, a dead wall. Maybe one day we will figure out these types of rejection and why they are so resistant to therapy because patients do lose their grafts eventually due to this type of uh, rejection. And the even, if the, even if the diagnosis is the cell mediate rejection, uh, this is the, what we find in, uh, in the current literature of the transplant nephrology and the tra clinical transplantation. Uh, we should look at anti chill antibodies and uh, asking about drug adherence because if we have T-cell mediate rejection accompanied by DSA, even if it is pure T-cell mediate rejection, uh, especially in non-adherent persons, this is a predictor for uh, poor graft survival. So sure. even if, if it is T-cell mediate rejection, we would like to know DSA. The We're president. going to have Yes, this. okay. Yes. Okay. The second type is um, uh, the one which targets the arteries. And uh, the defining legion uh, for it is a V-score or what we consider antimal arthritis. And according to the degree of the V-score, V1 or V2, we classified into type two. And if it's a V3, we classified into type three. So this is a score which uh, or antimal arthritis is actually evaluation of the presence and degree of inflammation within the arterial antima. Again, the score is based on the most severely affected artery, this dictates the score. Plus or minus fibrinoid necrosis. So fibrinoid necrosis is not involved in the scoring process. The scoring process mainly depends on the inflammation. Any level, any degree of the V-score can be associated with fibrinoid necrosis. Now let me show you. This is uh, an artery, this is a part of the wall of the artery. This is the, this is the endothelium and you can see the lymphocyte beneath the endothelium. And here is another one, and here is another one. This is what we call antimal arthritis. This is the V-score, and one cell is enough. If I only have this in an artery, this is enough to classify this artery as having an arterial rejection or a V-score. Bearing in mind that this is not antimal arthritis. These lymphocytes are are only marginating along, along the endothelium and you have some vacuolation within the endothelium, you have to see clearly and frankly the lymphocyte beneath the endothelium. A V is, uh, um, is scored according to the percentage of the antima uh, affected by the inflammatory cells, V1 being equal to or uh, less than 25% and V2 more than 25%. As you can see here, this is another artery and you can see the extent, it, all, it almost involves 100% of the lumen. Again, here, this is the endothelium, all over mixed, activated and detached together with the inflammatory cells, which are uh, all present sub-endothelium. The muscle here is paired. You don't see any lymphocytes in the media. As I said, fibrinoid necrosis can be present with any degree of uh, V, but usually more common with V2. And this is uh, frank fibrin fibrinoid necrosis or fibrin, also sub-endothelial together with the inflammatory uh, cells. And early fibrotic uh, changes are still to be seen here. This is another segment of the artery, and you can see also the endotheliolitis or the antimal arthritis quite uh, clearly. This patient had a T-cell mediated rejection with also significant tubulitis, as you can see here, and interstitial inflammation. Now V3 is when the inflammatory cells crosses the, uh, the antima and involves the whole thickness of the artery, what we call transmural and arthritis or transmural antimal arthritis or transmural arthritis for short. And this is a very severe form of rejection and this is why it is classified on a different, on a separate category as type 3 T-cell mediated rejection. 
So this is type three. This is what we call transmural arthritis. Usually you can see fibrinoid necrosis. You get this extensive inflammation. Mm. As you, this was an artery, and you can hardly see the wall of the artery from the amount of inflammation which is uh, which is there. The lymphocytes almost attacked, the, replaced the whole wall of the artery. Or you can have fibrinoid necrosis, also replacing the whole arterial wall, as in this artery. This is also V3, but the fibrinoid necrosis has to be within the whole thickness of the wall to classify it as V3. Um, v legions, as, you, uh, my, as I mentioned earlier, could also be seen within mm. the arterioles. As you can see, this arteriole also with, um, uh, with the inflammation and fibrinoid necrosis. And terminal arthritis or V-scored legions, and some uh, use the term transplant and arthritis, all means the same thing. It actually defines type 2 acute T-cell mediated rejection. So in 95% of cases, these legions are related to T cells. These are T cell mediated rejection. And this, this was basically up according to the classification to date. We still consider the V legions as T cell mediated rejection. However, in the last years, we started to have evidence relating the V legions to the presence of DSA or C4D. And in this nice study by Carmen Lofosher, she have noticed that biopsies who has actually um, evidence of antibody-mediated rejection, whether ABMR and arterial rejection, or the V legions, the V score, have much worse prognosis related to other types of rejection without the V. So look here. You can see the T-cell-mediated rejection, type 1 only T-cell-mediated rejection, without arterial involvement, without a V-score, actually fares quite well. And what follows uh, after it is T-cell mediated rejection with a V-score. Then comes antibody mediated rejection, but with no arterial involvement. And the worst, and there is a huge gap between these three types of rejection and this type of rejection. So the worst combination you can ever have in the biopsy is that to have a V-legion with evidence of antibodies, whether it's a DSA or C4D positive. So there is a six-fold increase in graft loss compared to antimal arthritis lesions without DSA, which are the ones which are pure T-cell mediated rejection. This actually can account in part for the frequent lack of a complete response of these lesions, which is reported by the regular or the routine treatment targeting only T-cell mediated rejection. So your patients which are diagnosed as, uh, v, um, as V scores with a C4D negative, and you really need to also consider doing DSA because they might have, the, the presence of DSA will make these, uh, these patients have a poor prognosis as well as more resistant to uh, the routine therapy of T-cell mediated rejection type two. Let's look at another case. This was a female patient. She, had, um, she presented on day five post-transplant with a serum creat of 4.5. Again, her operation on eventful. Again, she received no induction. Her original disease, according to a biopsy, but then outside, was chronic interstitial nephritis with FSGS. Post-operative course, her creat landed to 1.8 on day two, but then started to rise up to 4.5 in day uh, plus five. Her initial therapy was cyclosporin, MMF, and steroids. Patient had received pulses, steroids, cyclosporins, discontinued, and tacrolimus started. DSA was withdrawn, and a renal biopsy was obtained. Of course, the differential diagnosis is open, and these are just demonstration cases. We don't have, actually, um, unfortunately, enough time to discuss it. Again, the biopsy was adequate. We, have, we had two very nice cores of uh, cortical tissue, and as you can see on the low power, she had a mild interstitial infiltrate, and only this focus of um, a, a inflammation, interstitial inflammation, with a single a focus of a tubulitis. Her glomeruli also were more or less insignificant, but look at her arteries. And this is the first artery, and you can see we have easily V2 here. You have significant antimal arthritis. This is another artery with early fibrinoid necrosis, and again, a V2 legion, and this is, these are the arteries in trichrome stain, 
And all through, I just want to demonstrate the patient had absolutely no tubulitis and the interstitial inflammation was insignificant. So her score was T0, I0, V2, and she had a PTC1 and um, a TI1, and of course, no chronicity. This was just still the first week uh, post-transplant. And her C4D was negative, as you can see. So this patient is diagnosed as an isolated V2 lesion, which is consistent, again, with acute T-cell mediated rejection, BAF type grade 2B, which is arterial with fibrinoid necrosis, C4D negative. I'm trying to show you with the cases the way we uh, mainly report the biopsies, how we consider the score and how the scores and the other findings in the biopsies are translated into a diagnosis. And this is the commonest forms of diagnostic lines, but of course, each pathologist has his own wording into forming a diagnosis, but not the category. What about isolated V lesions? Now, isolated V means that we have only a V score without interstitial, sorry for the typo, without interstitial inflammation and or tubulitis. I remember that in 2009, when I was at the Banff meeting, and this was the first mention of the isolated V lesions, and they were discussing whether isolated V lesions should be considered as T-cell mediated rejection. And I said to myself, oh my God, I already sign out these cases as a T-cell mediated rejection. I never considered having a V-score that it can be different or that it can be caused by anything else other than rejection. So five years later in 2014, the Banff group have decided that isolated V shows comparable response to treatment and graft survival as V lesions, which has I and T score, meaning classic T cell mediated rejection, and thus most isolated V lesions should be reported as type 2 or 3 acute T cell mediated rejection. And in C4D negative cases, up to 13% of these isolated V biopsies were associated with DSA. So if the more chance of having a mixed form of rejection, a T-cell mediated rejection and evidence of antibodies are usually more common with the isolated V lesions rather than with the ones which has more interstitial infiltrate and tubulitis, but of course this is not a rule. And as I, uh, some isolated V lesions appear to represent acute antibody mediated rejection or mixed antibody mediated and T-cell mediated uh, rejection. So we don't use the term isolated V lesion anymore because we have proved over the years that these lesions are actually T-cell mediated rejection. So acute T-cell mediated rejection, which uh, occupies category four in the Banff classification, um, grade two is classified uh, according to the V score into again 2A, which is V1, uh, 2B, which is V2. And if the V is three, then this is grade three uh, type 2 T-cell mediated rejection. So again, we classify the degree of severity according to the extent of the score, V1, V2, or V3. Since Banff started in 1994 and till now, 2020, Banff had always uh, assigned a minimal criteria for the diagnosis of T-cell mediated rejection, a bit of a high threshold if you ask most pathologists which we're trying to work at on the T-cell mediated uh, rejection band group. However, still, this is the minimal criteria which for the diagnosis of T-cell mediated rejection, that you have an I2 and a T2. Okay, but what about cases which have T1? Now, tubulitis is aggressive and you have less than four tubular uh, lymphocytes per tubular cross-section in two foci, so you have a score of T1. What about cases which has I3 and a T1? If I have extensive interstitial inflammation, but I don't have a moderate tubulitis, what are we going to do with these cases? And due to this, borderline rejection was born, and the term suspicious for acute T-cell mediated rejection. This entity is used when we have no entomal arthritis, no V lesion. So the presence of V lesion, whether isolated or in association with I or T, is T-cell mediated rejection, end of story. But if we have T or an I, which is not up to the minimal criteria for the diagnosis of T-cell mediated rejection according to Banff, then 
we can consider the diagnosis of a borderline rejection. It still remains one of the most controversial entities. And back in 2004, Lily and Gaber have showed that biopsies with these features really represented acute rejection. And they did not respond to increased immunosuppression and often they have additional changes such as chronic rejection. And 10 years later, in 2012, molecular diagnosis have actually eliminated this borderline category because all these patients which were diagnosed histologically as borderline were reclassified into discrete T-cell mediated and non-T-cell mediated categories. However, since molecular diagnosis is not reproducible and we do not use it on um, a, a clinically on a routine uh, basis yet, in 2019, another look was taken on borderline rejection because what happened is that this category over the years, since 1994, has been considered a waste basket for any diagnosis which you cannot establish that it is rejection. So Banff re-emphasized again what we consider borderline rejection and added a low threshold and a high threshold to it. So any foci of tubulitis with I1 is a borderline rejection. And any T1 with any score of um, interstitial inflammation is also a borderline rejection. I know that this entity is not only the most controversial entity between pathologists, but also with, with nephrologists. And I know that most nephrologists hate it and they don't like this diagnosis. But you have to consider that this diagnosis is basically based on the criteria that it's suspicious. It could be a resolving rejection process. It could be an early rejection process. It could be a side effect of CNI toxicity. So there is a cause behind it. We need very proper clinical correlation when we come up with a diagnosis like borderline rejection in order to manage the patient. So we've talked about the acute all the acute scores which are related to the tubular interstitial. So what about chronic scores? We also evaluate chronic uh, uh, changes in the tubules and in the interstitial. We have the BAMF score CT, which evaluates the extent of cortical tubular atrophy, which is usually tightly associated with the areas affected with interstitial fibrosis, starting from absolutely no tubular atrophy one, two, three, up to 50%. So surface area, which is covering the tubular atrophy in the cortex. While BAF score CI evaluates the extent of cortical fibrosis. However, here we start from two up to 5% of cortical area. Meaning, as we've mentioned before, that we allow up to five to 7% actually of presence of fibrosis, which we consider it within the normal in the cortex, tubular basement membranes, perivascular fibrosis, and so on. And all what's above 5% or starting from 6% is started to consider CI1, and we classify into mild, moderate, and severe. Now, these two scores correlate very well with time post-transplantation in the setting of progressive disease of any cause and they have a significant correlation with allograft function and prognosis. And we've covered this when we've talked about tubular interstitium in native disease, that the tubular interstitial compartment is the main compartment which is related to the renal function. And it doesn't make a difference whether it's native or a transplant, it's still the same scenario. So this is the compartment which will significantly correlate with the allograft function. However, these scores have no diagnostic specificity meaning that we do not use the CT and the CI score to establish a diagnosis or to place a certain biopsy within one of the categories. In other words, we do not use the extent of tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis for chronic rejection. They are not considered criteria of a chronic rejection process. They can be present, of course, they need to be present within a chronic rejection, but on their own, the presence of interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, what we call IFTA, is not a one of the criteria for chronic rejection. Chronic rejection, as we're going to discuss, have specific criteria. When these criteria are fulfilled, we 
uh, we uh, place the biopsy whether into chronic active or chronic inactive form of rejection. But interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy on their own without any evidence of a chronic active rejection with them will just be categorized as IFTA. So you cannot relate this to chronic rejection because I know this causes a lot of confusion. And when you get a pathology report with a lot of, inter with a lot of IFTA in it, you consider that the patient has a chronic rejection. No. What about if we have both elements? tubular interstitial inflammation and fibrosis. We just discussed that in order to diagnose T-mediated rejection, BAMF does not score inflammation in scarred areas. We only score, we use the I score in non-scarred cortex. But the reality is that we have a lot of biopsies with a lot of inflammation, and this inflammation is associated with the fibrosis present in the biopsy what we started to call IFTA, or inflamed interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. And we start with which we use a TI score or an IFTA score, whatever it is. The background is of scoring inflammation in renal allograft biopsy, which started also in 2009, and this is a modification of the slide by Michael Mingle, is the concern that any inflammation may be bad for the graft and that I score deliberately avoid areas of fibrosis. So in order to be specific for an acute rejection diagnosis, but at the end of the day, what about this inflammation which is present in the core? If we consider this the core, and that this is 100% cortex, we have no medulla, we have 4% of this is non-scarred compartment and 60% has interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. And then, we have subcapsular infiltrate, and we have infiltrate within the interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, and we have perivascular infiltrate, and we also have nodular infiltrate in the scarred areas and in the non-scarred areas. If we applied the BANF I score, which is scoring inflammation in non-scarred area, then the score is one because we're only we're only going to score this. All of these forms of inflammation are not going to be scored. Maybe this area also of nodular inflammation. However, if we used an IF to score, then you will get a 67%. You're going to score the whole compartment. See, 10%, this is the BANF I score only. We have 5%, 3%. This is the nodular and perivascular we are, which we ignore. And then you have 40% of the inflammation in related to the interstitial fibrosis. So we needed an absolute score to reflect the total inflammatory burden of the graft. How much inflammation you have in scarred and in non-scarred areas because inflammatory cells are bad, whether they are related to fibrosis or unrelated to fibrosis. And hence, we came up with the IFTA score to score the, combi the combination of a interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy with the inflammation of any degree. And new definitions of chronic T-cell mediated rejection was introduced in 2015 to consider that we have a chronic form of T-cell mediated rejection, not only in the blood vessels, but also as it was before 2015, but also in the tubular interstitial compartment. So this is the, I, the IEFTA score. It scores inflammation in areas of interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. As I mentioned, it was first introduced in 2015, and also in scarred cortex. And as you can see, it follows the same uh, system, no inflammation, less than 10%, 10%, up to 50 and more than 50, and we score from zero to three. This was not, did not come out of the blues. We knew since 2010, um, a, that inflammation in areas of tubular atrophy, which is the chronic changes, was, were strongly correlated with renal allograft loss in the decaf study. This was followed by the study in 2016, where um, a, this, this group had studied gene expression in biopsies of acute rejection and IFTA, where they showed that they uh, actually ha share mechanisms that correlate with worse long-term uh, outcomes. 
and we have concluded that most IFTA samples have molecular evidence of ongoing immune-mediated injury, same as acute rejection samples. And they have, that was their opinion that even if no inflammation or histology was uh, present, and the molecular profiles which correlated with future graft loss in IFTA samples were actually significant. And they considered that acute rejection or T-cell mediated rejection and IFTA phenotypes are stages in the same alloimmune processes. So in 2015, we had major updates to the BAMF diagnostic criteria for T-cell mediated rejection. We included IFTA and it's associated with T-cell mediated rejection and so on. But more importantly, that a uh, few papers have uh, came up that, uh, in the last couple of years. Again, another paper by Carmen and T-cell mediated rejection is a major determinant of inflammation in scarred areas in kidney allografts. And you can see the difference in the survivals one year post-graft biopsy in patients where they have IFTA zero compared to patients with IFTA three. And again, um, here in the same, this is the probability of, uh, of the graft survival. And this is, again, there is here, there's something missing in this slide. Anyhow, this paper had uh, shown that this is a major determinant of allograft loss, inflammation in scarred areas. Then we have this very two nice outreach by Brian Nankoville from Australia, where Brian have looked at the causes, significance, and consequences of the inflammatory fibrosis in kidney transplantation, mainly targeting the banff i ifta Legion, and you can see the relationship between early T cell mediated rejection and I IFTA, and the renal function by one year in patients with I IFTA. These are the patients with inflammation and interstitial fibrosis, and this is the ones which have no inflammation but still have interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. So, even in the presence of interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, the presence of inflammation itself associated with this type of fibrosis will worsen the graft survival. And also that this, is, this was done with deaf sensor graft survival. And they have also shown that this was related to the type of immunosuppression and that these IFTA legions are more related to cyclosporin rather than uh, tacrolimus. So tacrolimus actually can manage the, uh, the burden of the total inflammatory burden present in the graft and that maybe these cases are related to under immunosuppression or non-compliance as we see and a lot of our patients. This is interstitial fibrosis, and you can see trichrome. This is a, a tubules, and you can see all of this green is the fibrosis, and you, has, you have the inflammatory cells. Again, extensive inflammation with a background of fibrosis. All of this is I IFTA. Then we have tubulitis within the, uh, a, the slightly atrophic, uh, moderately atrophic uh, tubules. Again, here you can see more to the wrinkle tubular basement membranes and tubulitis, so all of this is considered chronic active T-cell mediated rejection type one. However, T -cell, a chronic active T-cell mediated rejection is not only defined by the tubular interstitium, we've always known, and this had been present since the first month classification, where we only considered actually chronic active rejection is sclerosing transplant vasculopathy or the ones, the chronic changes which affect the arteries. We, what we call it, we call it sclerosis transplant vasculopathy or chronic allograft arteriopathy. All terms are accepted. This is a finding where you get marked thickening and reduction of the lumina of the arteries. And it occurs usually late after transplant, but you can see it following maybe after one year. And this lesion is usually preceded by antimal arthritis. So this lesion is usually preceded by an acute attack. Approximately of these uh, uh, legions are C4D positive. So around 30% are antibody mediated rejection, not T cell mediated rejection. These patients would present with a slow progressive rise in, secret, in serum creatinine. And there is no therapy, of course, if it's inactive, it's already chronic and they have poor long-term graft survival. It's the blood vessels and you get very ischemic kidneys. Look, this is one of our patients, and this was her biopsy 40 days post-transplant. She had a V2 uh, T-cell mediated rejection of type 2B, and this was her biopsy 15 months post-transplant, and look at the arteries. And this is typically V moving into CV or acute T-cell mediated rejection, which have transformed into chronic active T-cell mediated 
rejection. You have enough evidence to say that these, as we said, this is these cells, these legions are usually infiltrated by CD3 positive T lymphocytes. But by time you get also a lot of macrophages, which is CD68, and we know that macrophages are a major, major cells in the uh, formation of, uh, in the activation of fibroblasts and formation of fibrosis. You also, if you measure the proliferative, the, the, uh, the proliferative index, uh, which is present within the entoma at this time, we do it by KI67, you can see that this, these legions have a very high rate of proliferation, and eventually you get extensive myofibroblasts within the early legions. All of these are V. We still don't have any fibrosis, but you can see that you already have macrophages going on and you already have myofibroblasts in these lesions, which are the ones which actually transform into chronic lesions and hence the common, that this is a common scenario. Uh, within the process, the lymphocytes start to mingle with the myofibroblasts and start to migrate from the sub area into the adventitia and into the media of the blood uh, of the arteries. And you can see the lymphocytes here. And this is what we call a sclerosing uh, process or sclerosing vasculopathy because it's on its way for sclerosis. You can also get a, a, a dominant macrophage, as you can see, all of these forming histocytes here and you can get, uh, the infiltrate could be uh, predominantly macrophages. And then by time, as you say, you can get a more dominant element of fibrosis than the uh, inflammation like these arteries. Again, here you have the myofibroblastic uh, new antimal uh, formation as well as the inflammation. Sclerosing or sclerose transplant vasculopathy or arteriopathy is called by the CV score and according to the luminous or radius, uh, luminal or uh, the, the reduction of the lumina of the artery. Now, this is one, I'm just giving you an example of um, a, some of the problems with Banff, but those of you who read uh, the papers, and as I've mentioned uh, last time, this is a cumulative process and you really need to read more than one, you, could, you just cannot read the, the, only the updates. However, even though this one has a confusing array of terminologies, appearances and diagnostic implications. This is defined by an arterial fibroantimal thickening of vascular fibrous antimal thickening, which is mainly a chronic fibrous change like what we see in hypertension. Whereas sometimes when we come to include it within a chronic active rejection, this can be cellular and we can have a lot of lymphocytes and this is not reflected either in the definitions or the in, the in the score. Moreover, we have two different definitions for the same lesion in the same classification. If we come to, in, you read it within as a manifestation of chronic T cell mediated, it's defined as arterial antimal fibrosis with monuclear cell infiltration. If it is a criteria for chronic ABMR, it's considered arterial entomal fibrosis, excluding other causes with sclerotic entoma and so on. So even the definitions are not consistent, which is also a major source of confusion. And it's not always easy to differentiate. It's not always easy to exclude a prior T-cell mediated rejection a process or to, to prove that you have no prior history of a biopsy proven T-cell mediated to classify this as a chronic antibody mediated rejection. So chronic active T-cell mediated rejection, according to 2017 and since 2017 until 2019, is classified into two grades, grade one and grade two. Grade one is the ones which are related to the tubular interstitial, again, utilizing a minimal score of IFTA2 or IFTA3 and T2. So I can have only IFTA, but if I don't have tubulitis, I'm not going to diagnose it as a chronic active T cell mediated rejection. I need the evidence of activity and the evidence of activity in this scenario is the presence of tubulitis. And again, the difference between 1A and 1B is the extent of tubulitis. And then grade two is chronic algraft arteriopathy. So actually chronic active T cell mediated rejection is the other face of the coin for the acute T cell mediated rejection. We have the same criteria, the same minimal thresholds to, uh, to achieve a rejection process with. The only difference is that here in the score, we use the chronic scores for the interstitial inflammation and 
for the uh, affection of the arteries, but we still require evidence of activity in the tubular interstitial compartment, while this is not required in the arterial compartment. Let's look at this patient. This is a 28-year-old male who received the living unrelated transplant. Uh, I don't see the rest of the slide. Yes, on December 2012. Unknown original disease, negative cross match. Again, no induction. Maintenance therapy was mTOR, low dose CNI, MMF, and steroids. He was discharged on creat 0.921 and a protocol biopsy on six months. So this was not an indication biopsy. This was a protocol biopsy. Now look at this nice protocol biopsy. And this patient had extensive interstitial inflammation, an I2 and a T3, actually. He had a few eosinophils, and I don't think he had arteries in this first biopsy. His C4D was negative, and DSA was withdrawn post-biopsy, and it was negative. And his diagnosis was acute T-cell mediated rejection, BAMF type grade 1B. So we had a severe form of tubular interstitial rejection and T4D negative. And I couldn't uh, exclude an associated arterial component because the biopsy did not have any arteries. Patient was treated with anti-rejection therapy and returned on follow-up visit with a creatinine of 1.2, which was accepted. However, three months later, his creatinine became 1.8 and started to rise, so they repeated the biopsy. Now look at the second biopsy. Remember, the first biopsy did not have any interstitial fibrosis, or maybe minimal. Look now. Look at his trichrome. He has started to have significant interstitial fibrosis, and we still have significant interstitial inflammation. And within these areas of inflammation, we had tubulitis, and he had a single artery, I think, which was mildly thickened. His C4D, again, was negative. I don't know about the DSA this time. However, his diagnosis came as he had a persistent acute T-cell mediated rejection because he had inflammation in the non-squared areas, which was classified this time as BAMF type 1A. So his acute element was less in severity, but it was still there. But he also had chronic active T-cell mediated rejection, mainly tubular interstitial, which was BAMF grade 1A. So now what? Are these two diagnoses? Do the patient have two processes going on? Or actually, this represents a continuation of the same process. And I want to tell you that this is the more common scenario of what we see in our biopsies. And because of this, in 2019, in Banff, a survey actually was circulated among nephrologists, nephrolo uh, uh, pathologists, as well as uh, a transplant surgeons on how we want to place the diagnosis or what do they think of chronic active T-cell mediated rejection. And as you can see, most actually of the responses favored that we want the acute component together with the chronic, with the chronic component. So we want chronic active T-cell mediated rejection with the mentioning of active component, which meet, meet the uh, criteria. And nobody wants that we just mention an IFTA, that this is a moderately inflamed IFTA. Everybody wanted whether we have an acute element of T-cell mediated rejection or not, usually borderline, together with the chronic active T-cell mediated rejection, because this is going to give you a sign or a hint how you could manage this patient. And in relation, uh, when the survey went on how do you treat chronic active T-cell mediated rejection, 36% of, um, of the nephrologists, I think this was uh, circulated among 46 transplant centers and uh, they had uh, routinely, 36% of them routinely in Europe and in, um, in the States and in South America. And as you can see, 36% routinely treat chronic active T cell mediated rejection with routine anti-rejection treatment. Under 50% uh, uh, have, have condition treatment. If there is no severe interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, they treat. Uh, and uh, all of them may, mainly uh, counted, a, it depends on I and V score, 
or if the patient has clinical impairment. This was only 4%. And only 15% have said that they treat this lesion rarely only because there is lack of enough data and that they think that the risks of the immunosuppression outweighs the benefits or they have experience of in, um, uh, ineffectiveness of the immunosuppression. So let me finish after discussing T-cell mediated rejection. Do we currently consider it a problem? We know that we've been now for more than 10 years since we've been, we figured out uh, antibody mediated rejection and we started investigating it that a lot of people have started to consider that T-cell mediated rejection is no longer a significant problem and that it actually has little impact on graft function in the absence of concurrent antibody mediated induced or C4D positive graft injury. The main focus is always whether we have TSA or not, whether this patient has antibodies or not. And even some have considered that chronic active T-cell mediated rejection is a diagnosis which doesn't exist and that all chronicity in the graft is believed to be induced by antibodies. However, we have enough evidence in the literature and ongoing studies which actually emphasize the importance of persistent T-cell mediated inflammation as a contributing element to progressive graft dysfunction. So when we come to consider the graft dysfunction and the graft survival, T-cell mediated rejection becomes the major determinant of your graft survival. And the same group actually in an earlier investigation have reported T-cell mediated to be a commoner cause of graft loss 19% than antibody mediated rejection 2.1%. This is a May Clinic group, by the way. And then another study showed that T-cell mediated rates were increased with DSA. So actually you have DSA, you have T-cell mediated uh, rejection with a trend to increase rates when the PRA was more than zero in the absence of DSA. This study or these results could represent a form of mixed rejection. Followed, if you look more at the literature, that actually the presence of concurrent T-cell mediated rejection is an independent risk factor for graft failure, even in patients with antibody mediated rejection. Because when you get a diagnosis of a mixed rejection, you mainly focus on antibody mediated rejection, while what's going to make the patient lose their grafts are possibly, possibly the untreated T-cell mediated rejection. And this very nice study by, uh, by Dorjik, which actually reflects what we see in our routine practice, when they looked at 63% of early and 96% of late antibody mediated rejections, they have found, uh, sorry, they have found an element of T-cell mediated rejection in up to 63% of early antibody mediated and almost 100% of late antibody mediated um, uh, rejection when they included the borderline category. Whether T cells come in secondary to hemorrhoid damage, whether the T cell mediated rejection occurs first and acts as a sensitizing event for the later onset of antibody mediated rejection, that does not diminish the importance of T cell mediated rejection and the need for implementing T cell therapies in these patients side by side with antibody directed therapies. We are overstressing antibody mediated rejection up to the degree of neglecting concomitant TCMR in the same biopsies and neglecting them in the report and neglecting them in the, in the treatment of the patients. And I'll leave you with the notion that yes, T cell mediated rejection is still a major problem for our renal algrafts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wissam, for this excellent and detailed a focus on the T-cell mediated. I have a couple of comments and then to open the discussion. Uh, so the, to start with, nowadays there is no 100% pure T-cell and 100% pure antibody mediated rejection. Antibody mediated rejection may have a component of T-cell and T-cell may stimulate antibody formation. And even in antibody mediated rejection, nowadays, nowadays we learn it to test even uh, for soluble CD30 is uh, added to the armamentarium of antibody that denotes T cell activation. So always there is a, a interaction and a close collaboration of T and B uh, in the damaging of the graft. Um, uh, uh, the, one of the most important points to uh, clarify, the presence of sufficient biopsy is mandatory for diagnosis because we may have a, a biopsy for patient who has 
clinical grafts function, and then it is borderline rejection and the artery, uh, vasculitis or arthri arthritis is missed. So to have sufficient biopsy is mandatory. Uh, today, you clarified the degree of fibrillin necrosis. Not each degree of fibrillin necrosis equal V3. And I like this point. Uh, I want to ask you about another point, the presence of interstitial hemorrhage. Is it a surrogate marker for V3 or not? If you find excessive interstitial hemorrhage in the biopsy. So, uh, sorry, I, uh, yes, no, yes. Okay. Uh, interstitial hemorrhage is a bad sign. Let's say this. So when yes. I have interstitial hemorrhage in the biopsy, I consider vascular involvement. So two options, not, not a specific V-score, no. Any V-score or any arterial rejection can cause, to inter, it can cause interstitial hemorrhage. But I would consider first antibodies. Yes. There has to be a reason behind the hemolysis we see and the hemorrhage which is there in the biopsy. So interstitial hemorrhage is a bad, um, is a bad sign in the biopsy. It's an alerting sign that you have something else which is probably missed in the, um, in the biopsy. One of, also, one of clinical important findings is the early and delayed, the timing of active T cell, acute T-cell immediate rejection. Always we find late and uh, acute uh, T-cell immediate rejection uh, probably doesn't respond to, to treatment. So this is quite frustrating for us to find late uh, acute T-cell immediate Usually, rejection. Yes, that's because um, out of, ex uh, of personal experience and also the uh, evolving literature that usually the late ones are associated with DSA. Yes. So yeah. So usually uh, this is what you will see almost as, I'm, as we're going to discuss next time by thoughts well that um, in most of type two ABMR you get a borderline rejection actually more than 90%. I would like so, to, con to congratulate you about this point because now it is routine. Whenever we have to see immediate rejection we should order testing for the SA. If it's because yes. it, will, it will help us to guide the immune suppressive drugs and also to predict the prognosis of the graft. So you know, we've included it in our uh, upcoming transplant since, guidelines. Since, since uh, years, whenever yes. you have impaired uh, graft function, you have to withdraw uh, DSA. And to stress upon the history of drug adherence, because mm -hmm. drug adherence, if it's, if there is non adherence plus anti chill antibody within the context of acute cell immediate rejection, the prognosis is gloomy. Uh, and the last point from my side is the mixed rejection. Mixed rejection also is bad, and I think you will tackle it in the next uh, presentation. Yes. Uh, now um, uh, I'm going to invite Professor Halawa uh, to uh, to have his comments. Um, you know, with that compliment, actually, you highlighted um, you know uh, a lot of debates about the plasma-rich um, uh, uh, um, uh, cell mediated rejection which is very interesting, and also the um, uh, clinical significance of inflammatory infiltrate in a scarred area, because we used to ignore in the uh, biopsy. So this is a scarred area, so ignore, ignore it, even we don't look at it. Uh, but I have two questions here. Number one, regarding the neutrophil infiltrations. You know, if you have, you know, we usually, we, we have been, you know, uh, through a lot of practice in terms of neutrophil infiltration. You know, if infection was excluded, it might indicate a poor prognosis because we, we keep looking for fibroid, necro, uh, you know, antibody mediated rejection, severe antibody mediated rejection. Is it true or not? So neutrophil infiltration, you know, sometimes um, uh, as a mirror image of antibody mediated rejection. Um, do you think this is a, a, a right statement? Uh, not entirely. The context is fine, but the statement has to be rephrased. Neutrophils in peritubular capillaries. All right, okay. Not yeah. neutrophils within an interstitial inflammation and not neutrophilic tubulitis. Mm. So if I have neutrophils in peritubular capillaries, and we're going to discuss this next time, Yes, I'm going to, to uh, of course, consider ABMR, but if the patient is ABMR negative, then consider early uh, pyelonephritis. This is where early pyelonephritis starts. Yeah. And but, I, I think this is an evolution. 
this is an evolution, and, uh, I, and I think Professor Hussam will discuss it next time, that mm -hmm. in the early beginning of Britoia capillaritis, we stressed upon lymphocytes. Nowadays, it doesn't matter which type of the cell within the, the Britoia capillaries, and I think it will be clarified in the next time. Uh, but for neutrophil infiltration, uh, we should discriminate between uh, neutrophil infiltration for the parenchyma of the tubule and the presence of the neutrophil within the cast, within the, the tubular uh, lumen. No, if it's in the cast or you have neutrophil it is nephritis, yes. or if you have an interstitial inflammation, it doesn't have to be called a pyelonephritis, yes. it can be called an infectious tubular interstitial okay. nephritis. But what's related, uh, so it's the site. Where are you seeing the neutrophils? Neutrophils in glomeruli and in peritubular capillaries, as Professor Harawa has mentioned, okay. definitely have a different implication. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The second question is, it's basically clinical because, you know, if you have mild antibody mediated rejection, which is steroid responsive, it's mm -hmm. quite early as well. I don't think, you know, based on the literature, it will affect the graft prognosis. But, you know, it's late steroid resistant in highly sensitized patients. Uh, this is usually associated with poor prognosis. Um, so early and late are related to the time post-transplant. That's right. right. Because, uh, again, you know, so well, you know the yeah. debate yeah. about late... But I'm difficult. going to ask you what, do, what, what, what you consider a mild AVMR because we actually have no, absolutely no types. It is, and uh, we it can is our... It is our... our the the next session. So I, we can... Uh, it would uh, be uh, much more appropriate. And this is an excellent question. I think so this is, this is our, our perspectives, uh, Dr. Ahmed. It is from, this is a, clinic, a, cl a clinical aspects of the disease. So antibody mate rejection, irrespective to its degree in the pathology, uh, uh, attains poorer prognosis, as shown from the many literatures and many experience everywhere. The, if, if, if let's, let's, yeah. let's, let's delay this discussion to next time. Okay, keep okay. No, 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 I'm talking about anti, I'm, I'm talking about uh, T cell mediated mild yes. rejection, not antibody okay. mediated. Yeah, yeah sorry. Oh, well, so yeah. I, I want to, I, I want to uh, include... Yes, of course. Oh, yes, of course. Um, uh, mild, uh, and Hussein also have, have just mentioned the same point. Um, the experience, excuse me, Dr. Hussain, excuse me, Dr. Uh, regarding your question, Dr. Halawa, it is quite a puzzle because sometimes we have even borderline changes, suspicious of rejection, and the patient doesn't respond. The clinical pathological correlation is not 100% perfect. Pathology is one piece of the puzzle. We, we, this, and this is our task. Sometimes we have mild rejection that doesn't respond to treatment. And we have advanced degree of uh, t cell mate rejection and response well to treatment. So at the end of the day, it is uh, the matter of uh, treatment and evaluation of the tre treatment with meticulous follow-up of the patients. It is not 100% true to find the correlation between mild degree of pathology and response of therapy. Now, I think Professor said my question is different. Uh, it's all about the prognosis of mild, early uh, steroid response. Yes, it is good. Rejection. It is because good, and there is classified as um, a, a poor prognosis, uh, you know, a poor prognosis marker of okay. uh, direct survival. But, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether definitely it's associated with poor graph survival or not. Uh, it's classified uh, according, Dr. Ha, it is classified according to the response of treatment. Suppose that after treating rejection by pulse steroid and uh, kidney function improved uh, to the baseline, 100% to the baseline. So, so this will be uh, of good prognosis so long as we keep mind to look at the drug adherence and the, uh, to, uh, to maintain immune suppressive and satisfactory level. But if uh, after treating rejection, there is a grade midway, so a creatinine increase between 25 to 75% of the baseline, above the baseline, this is moderate prognosis. And if it doesn't respond, it is poorer prognosis. So early rejection does completely respond to treatment if we uh, continue with drug adherence and following up these patients, I think the prognosis is good. Okay, just to comment uh, on, uh, on, um, uh, on Ahmed's question, the point is that you have no 100% way to tell you that these early rejections have actually completely responded. 
So this is why they are being accused and implicated in the literature of cutting a poor prognosis. These are the ones who remain with the minimal residual infiltrate, which does not affect the renal function, and which you are not seeing. Uh, plus, uh, once you have um, a T-cell mediated rejection attack, patients are more prone to recurrent forms of rejection. And if they are non-compliant to their treatment, then you, you definitely get these types of rejection more on a subclinical or presenting with a slow uh, progressive uh, form. Same way we regard uh, ABMR. So this is why T-cell is still implicated as a poor prognosis. It is because a it's, it's not that easy yeah. to get rid of these cells. And you can never actually know whether you treated the patient on a morphological level or not, just with the serum creatinine. Uh, and I think the best way is to avoid rejection by offering the best matching drug adherence and to keep up uh, eye on the uh, level of immune suppressive drugs. We have Professor Yad Saeed, uh, excuse me, but Professor Halawa, did, did you finish? Uh, uh, thank you very much, yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, Dr. Yad, please, if you have any, any points. مساء الخير مساء الفل يا باشا انا وسام شكرا جزيلا دكتوره وسام على المحاضره القيمه جدا جدا ملاحظتين الملاحظه الاولى بصراحه على البوردر لاين ريجكشن ذات يو منشن از ذس از ريلي دان وات يو منشن اون بروتوكول بايوبسيز اور اون انديكيتد بايوبسيز اوف دي بوردر لاين ريجكشن اون بوث بايوبسيز يس اون بوث بايوبسيز اون بوث اوكي So on both, you know, really to us as a nephrologist taking care of patient when we do the biopsy, and I think we are looking for good help from the pathologist. Borderline rejection means nothing for us. Yes, I know. Okay, that really means nothing. Is there is rejection or no rejection? You have to stick your neck and you have to be sharp when telling us what to do because based on this, we have to treat. And anyway, I think if we suspect rejection, most of the time we are already starting the treatment and the biopsy. Usually if you do it, it will be done if there is failure of the initial pulse steroid therapy. Because most of our patients, you know, they are really reluctant to go for a kidney biopsy, you know, just with the situation. So uh, we need a good criteria. Now, most of the labs nowadays, they do have DSAs. Most of the labs, they do C4D, and it's negative, it's negative. So if there is any mild tubulitis, mild interstitial infection, <clears throat> I think we have to say there is rejection. You know, please, if you take that borderline from your uh, vocabulary, that would be great for us as a nephrologist. I don't know what you think, Dr. Hussein. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Riyad, for this point. But if there is increasing creatinine and the pathology is borderline, we treat. And if there we is treat. no, oh, yes, yes. We treat and if there is no response, I personally prefer to test for uh, repeat the biopsy uh, and to repeat the biopsy at the end of the day, because as I mentioned. Maybe it is borderline because we miss the vessels or we miss some uh, other part of the. Sampling. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the the most so we should both clinical and the pathological together, and and take the at the end of the day. Uh, I, I didn't mention in my commentary points chronic T cell mediated rejection. I don't like chronic T cell mediated rejection, and when I when we decide to treat chronic T cell mediated rejection, we look at the rate of rise of creatinine, and the history of treatment if the patient was treated with several rejection episodes because we learned from our experience that ATG will not add anything if uh, we have chronic T-cell mediated rejection beyond one year of transplantation. So uh, chronic T-cell mediated rejection is very bad disease. Uh, also borderlines, we have a couple of cases, borderline that is very resistant to, to, to treatment. So it's better to do rebiopsy and when, even whenever we did biopsy, sometimes we don't have a 100% answer because any test, even if it is biopsy, has its limitations. So clinical and the pathological together, and we may ask for the help of the lab and the serology as well. I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Riyad. Uh, Dr. Lghamdi. Professor Lghamdi. Uh, 
Maybe you can treat you. Uh, Professor you... Faisal? Yes, Professor Faisal. Thank you, Hussein, very much. Thank you. Uh, I enjoy the talk very much, Hussein. You are excellent. And uh, every day we know something new from you. Thank and you uh, my concern was about, again, the same issue which Dr. Riyad said about the borderline. Uh, usually, you know, even without having the pathology as a borderline, the criteria, the criteria of the patient himself, if he had high creatinine, start to have some sort of, you know, clinically not proven by pathology rejection, and we treat them. Uh, we still give them anti-rejection if we don't have the facility to do biopsy, and we get used to this before. So still, even borderline, uh, they can help us a little bit even if it is borderline. This is my own view. Uh, and I enjoyed the discussion very much. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Christine. Thank you. Uh, uh, Just a single comment on the borderline category. Um, you have to um, you know that the background is that we are always worried of overdiagnosis of rejection and hence overimmunosuppression of the patients. This is why the very strict criteria for diagnosis of an active acute rejection, which most of us think that it's a high threshold, and that's our back door. So yes, it is classified as a rejection, and we are telling you it is suspicious for rejection. So there is no need to get so much confused about it. It, 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 go with your instincts, your whole clinical um, uh, or evaluation of the patient. It's just that you cannot just leave it open for any tubulitis score or any inflammation score, or at the end of the day, all the patients will be diagnosed as um, a rejection. So this is why that um, we need to be very strict on these patients because anti-rejection treatment is not a trip to anybody wants to go through. And also, Professor Usam, I like your statement about the, molec the, uh, the, the molecular testing to know uh, if the borderline is just T regulatory cells infiltrating the graft. I think the, 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 the place of uh, uh, full molecular pattern will be for patients with stable creatinine uh, for protocol biopsy. And as you mentioned, it is not validated in every lab. So uh, at the end of the day, we should follow our clinical sense of completing the patients. If we have borderline rejection, the patient received the four courses of anti-rejection, so we may just increase baseline immune suppressive drugs. But if the patient was not treated before by pulse steroid, we treat the patient uh, because borderline at the end of the day, it is inflammatory infiltrate within the graft. Well, the molecular evaluation and the role of the molecular microscope uh, is really beyond the scope of these yes. uh, lectures. We cannot go into it, or we are going to need more even uh, double um, in the time. And I won't put it at the top of the list as it's not really a bedside uh, procedure that we actually do for our patients in most of the world. So I said this. Why. I said this because there are some authors all over the world, denying the, uh, the term borderline. And there are a lot of articles saying, is borderline a, a, a real entity in the pathology? So th there are some people who deny even the diagnosis of borderline, but- I don't like it either. I but, don't like it. Yeah, but, but, but we like, we like to suspicious- it. There is nothing else to, uh, uh, to place the biopsy, uh, to place the biopsy in. Yes. Dr. Yasser Al-Mulla. Excellent discussion and outstanding presentation. Nothing much to add. Thank you, Yasser. Thank you very much. Dr. Yasser Al-Hamid. Thank you, excellent, excellent presentation and excellent discussion. Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Wissam totally that we over uh, deal with antibody mediated rejection and sometimes ignore the element of T-cell mediated rejection. And this element, may be the one that is responsive to steroids at the start of the treatment. When we give steroids, we have a response on it. But the element that is very important to steroids at the start of the treatment, we are all focusing on the element of antibody mediated rejection. Thank you for uh, your talk and for this uh, interview session. Thank you. Dr. Montasser. Thank you, Dr. Yasser. Thank you very much, Professor Yasser. Dr. Montasser. 
do you like to add because the Dr. Montessor has a good experience in transplantation? Do you like to add any? It seems that he has problem in the technology. Dr. Tariq Hamtawi? So your comment please. The technical part that was in the new lab, I lost it. Okay, congratulations. What is your opinion and do you have any points to add to the discussion? لا هو طبعا يعني الدسكشن كانت فيري نايس فروم اول اودينس لكن uh, برضو هي المشكله في البوردر لاين بايوبسي بتبقى مسليدنج دايما في الـ في الدايجنوزيس اوف ريجكشن واكشولي يمكن الباثولوجيست بيبقى خايف من الاوفر ايميونو سبريشن بالنسبه لل للبيشنتس لكن اكشولي برضو وي هاف تو بوت ان كونسيدريشن انا لما بيبقى يجي لي بايوبسي داوت فول فور ريجكشن اي بروسيد ان انكريزنج ايميونو سبريسيف بليز دكتور دكتور منتصر بليز بيكوز اي هاف ا نوت هير تو سبيك ان انجلش بيكوز وي هاف ماني attendees from uh, uh, Europe and from Liverpool. Yeah. So uh, yeah. you say that borderline is quite distressing for us. I agree with you 100%. And not, this is not the problem of pathology diagnosis. It's the, the problem of the pathology because every single uh, test has uh, its limitation, not 100%. But the problem is that you are expecting that the pathologists are um, having a magic tool to answer everything. They, are, they have tools, and I remember uh, the president of Mansoor University, Professor Kamal Din Kamal Ahmed, uh, when he mentioned that after 50 or 60 years of experience in pathology, he may uh, have one, one total uh, uh, day uh, and cannot judge is it malignancy or inflammation. So sometimes there are big puzzles and uh, and even tubulitis, that is the whole mark of acute cell mediated rejection, it is not specific 100% for rejection. It is, uh, so, but, but this is what we have. The gold standard is not 100% uh, coping or, or correlating with clinical problems. This is why- Surely at the end, it is a matter of uh, uh, correlation between uh, pathological report and uh, clinical uh, situation. Perfect. Uh, to judge and evaluate uh, the condition and accordingly you manage your uh, patient. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Montasser. Do you, do, you, do you want to add anything, Dr. Tariq Tantawi? Uh, it's great presentation and nice discussion. Actually, uh, the decision uh, at the end, uh, clinical pathological correlations is of paramount important. And uh, a wise decision uh, from using or abusing of immunosuppressive drugs, and a lot of issues could be uh, to put in mind when we're dealing with difficult scenarios, especially when the result or the lab is not matched with the pathological need. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tari. Dr. Halawa, do you like? Uh, to uh, no, actually, you know, uh, Professor. Because Hussein, it, it seems that it is difficult to speak today about viral nephropathy, and, and I don't like to exhaust all of you. And uh, I, I would like uh, uh, to ask Professor Wissam to be patient with us, even if we have yes. uh, other sessions, even multiple sessions. Yes, uh, we uh, need just it. Just to, to, uh, to allow people to grasp and understand everything. Yes. Yes. Um, because if we start viral, we'll, it will be in okay. hurry. <laughs> Yeah. Do you agree, Professor Usama, at this point, to, yeah. to post all viral, agree. even to the, the uh, not the next session, to the third session. So next session will be antibody mediated because this is a sequence and they leave viral and the calcium inhibitor to uh, further session. So please okay. be patient with us. Professor Halao. Yeah, actually, a few questions here from um, our friends and colleagues from Liverpool. Please. Uh, from Asadullah, in case of plasma rich rejection, uh, do you do special stain uh, surgical investigation to rule out PTLD, Dr. Rosam, Professor Rosam? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I was answering him on the chat. Not really, but uh, it helps if we're doubting it to, uh, to check for the monoclonality of the infiltrate we're saying. And when we come to discuss nephropathy, I'll show you that we did have PCLD cases because if they are prominent, we check for the type of T lymphocytes. And if they are monoclonal, then um, this is enough uh, base uh, to, uh, to consider PTLD. You know, early PTLDs are really extremely difficult to diagnose, both clinically and uh, histologically. And there are uh, some labs in the US and in Europe which stands for EBV. Yeah. And virus. also, Dr. Halawa, I recommend here to test serology for BK virus as well. Because there are, even in pathology, SCV40, there is false negative <coughs> in 20 to 30% of the cases. So, uh, I'm not worried about this thing. False okay. negative SCV40? No. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but that's if you don't, maybe if you don't have Medulla in the biopsy. But yeah. this is, yeah. Uh, this is, yeah, but PTLD is not related to. Um, no, no, uh, I, I don't say about PTLD. Uh, yes, I say no. for the, the broad differential diagnosis of plasma rich uh, rejection. Uh, or, or plasma cell infiltrate. If we have plasma cell in, infiltrate and we exclude BTLD and we think of antibody mediated rejection and the, we request the ACNs negative, uh, sometimes we bought, yeah, really we bought BK in, in mind and to test for BCR for BK and also SCV40 in the tissues because BK is one of the diseases that may be associated with rich plasma infiltrate. This is oh, what I mean. Oh, yes, of course. And uh, also to add and to be very uh, straightforward, if I have a plasma cell which infiltrates PTLD, is down the list. Okay, I, I, yes, I agree. So uh, down the list. we start and with PK? Uh, I start with the viral infections. Yes, PK. And the plasma cell rich uh, T cell mediated region. Plasma cells, we, we, I have to consider T, uh, PTLD at the end, but... Um, I wouldn't, I would, if I have a dense lymphocytic infiltrate, then PTLD will be top of the list. Yes, yes. So with plasma cell, rich rejections, PTLD will be down the list after the viral uh, infection. So you would be clear about, uh, about this. Why I'm stressing on the viral, Professor Halawa, because if we diagnose it as rejection, severe rejection, and we give over immune suppression, the patient is BK, this will uh, 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 make the things very problematic and the prognosis will be bad. Yeah, yeah, I'm very grateful to Professor Sam. You mentioned clearly we have to rule out viral infection, whatever viral infection is, okay. before embarking on treatment because okay. it's a very poorly responding uh, uh, type of rejection. We, okay. you, know, you, you made it very clear. Thank you very much for this. Yes, it Do rarely have... responds. And there is a question also from um, uh, some of the audience if there is any role of rituzenib and plasma rich T cell mediated rejection. And the answer is no. Valcade have been tried and tried. There is a very new uh, treatment for uh, multiple myeloma because, of course, it's the treatments of multiple myeloma which targets plasma cells. But this is a drug with, if you read the side effects, you would probably die before you even uh, try it. But this is, yes. Um, and some centers have already, this, this is published literature, uh, or maybe it's under publication, but some centers or some scientists have tried this uh, a drug. I don't remember its uh, its name. This is within the last uh, year on these patients with plasma-rich cell mediated rejection and the reported um, a good results. So this is the most new uh, evidence we have in the literature in relation to this type of rejection. But of course, this is a very risky um, uh, process. And very expensive as well. Okay. Oh, of course, extremely Dr. expensive. Dr. Halawa, so uh, even bortezomib is um, tested for management of antibody mediated rejection. And uh, I, I think the uh, study was brought to JET or something like, I, I forget the name, and it was not very successful in managing uh, antibody mediated rejection. Uh, but it is one of the armamentarium that we have. So if we decide at the end of the day, plasma rich rejection is uh, antibody is, is uh, associated with antibody mediated rejection, we can apply the protocol of active antibody mediated rejection, including IVIG, uh, plasma exchange, uh, and we may give bortezomib as one of the drugs at the end of the day because it will inhibit plasma. Uh, Professor Halawa, uh, do you have any question, other questions? No, 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 thank you very much. No, 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 at all. Thank you very much. You know, uh, you made everything clear. 
so uh, Dr. Al-Ghamdi, if uh, he if he has any, it's okay. So, uh, Dr. Wissam, uh, uh, we are appreciating your efforts to enrich our uh, our mind. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Yasser wrote it is uh, uh, it is uh, okay. I have the the uh, bro uh, Bortject. Yes, it is Bortject trial. Yes, I remember the name. And I remember this trial that uh, the, the drug was not m a magic, but on individual patients, uh, if we apply the first line of treatment, uh, yes, it is published in Jensen and Jason 2018. If we apply the first line of treatment, which is IVIG, plasma exchange, and even rituximab, and no, and no response, we may give bortezomib, or we may give interleukin-6 receptor antagonist for treating aggressive antibody rejection. But at the end of the day, plasma rich rejection is uh, is uh, quite cumbersome and uh, carries a lot of of, of misses. Uh, okay, remind me next time I give this talk to omit the plasma cell rich rejection <laughs> and the bone marrow category. We don't like them. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes, we can discuss other things. And the third one is coronic T cell mediated rejection. I hate, the third one. I hate yeah. it very yeah. much. <laughs> uh, so at the end of this presentation. Uh, it is very nice, excellent, fruitful presentation for uh, and in included a clinical pathological discussion at the end of the presentation. And um, uh, uh, we will ask Professor Sam to be patient with us, even if we have other multiple sessions, because today this is the 12th. If we continue for 15th, it doesn't matter. But you will leave to the library and to the education. A uh, treasure, a uh, treasure, sure. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah. Thank you all for your Thank attention. Thank you, everyone, and uh, good night. Uh, for your participation, and goodbye. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to upload the video to the YouTube. Thank you, and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Professor Halal. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.